The original game, Call of Duty, no number, no tagline, no subtitle, just Call of Duty, was developed by Infinity Ward and released in 2003. The original game was a spiritual successor to Medal of Honor Allied Assault, having been made by the same team. And as someone who started with Call of Duty 2, the original Call of Duty was quite a surprise for me. The game is very far from all the games that would follow it, and share its title. It's almost strange to say that it feels more like a modern day Counter-Strike game than it does a modern day Call of Duty. If I showed you this footage with no context, it would be difficult to tell what game it came from, apart from the dime a dozen second world war shooters of the time. I know the Call of Duty series is old, although I never really thought it would start with a game like this. Not to make it sound like a bad game, but it's most certainly different. Yeah, I had forgotten this game came out in 2003 and wasn't going to have a massive plethora of options available for it. Rather than downloading a fan patch that fixes the resolution and frame rate, I decided to leave the game raw for the sake of the review. I selected veteran difficulty. This would be a decision that I would come to regret rather quickly. You see, one of the major mechanics that differs in this game is that the health bar doesn't automatically regenerate. In order to restore your health, you have to find health packs on the ground, almost like you would in Doom or Halo. While the trick to veteran difficulty is that there are no health packs for the entirety of the game, which means that every level you start with full health, and that's it for the entirety of the level. Being I wanted a more authentic experience, both for the sake of recording and for my sanity, I swapped down to hardened difficulty. Not to say that this was any easier. The enemies in this game are brutal. They do an immense amount of damage to the player and take an immense amount of damage before actually dying. I can't remember the last time that I played a Call of Duty where shooting an enemy only staggered them and then they would get back up with their weapon a few seconds later. This means you have to adapt to the 007 Goldeneye approach of killing enemies. If you don't see them drop their gun, they're not dead. And being that they are almost instantly replaced by an identical enemy means that many missions become a non-stop onslaught, akin to something like Left 4 Dead. Anyway, back to the campaign. You start with a training mission in Georgia. All the missions in this campaign are represented with these interesting journal entries or order sheets that are shown during the loading screens. They would have been fun little reads in a world without SSDs. It's probably easy to say that shooting in this game is much better done from the hip. Not only is aiming from the hip much more accurate than in most COD games, but you can't even aim with ADS. The gun's massive fireballs block your line of sight if their iron sights weren't already disruptive enough. After you complete the tutorial, you're straight out of Georgia and right into a Band of Brothers ripoff. I can understand it's difficult to depict Normandy when so many other games and films have already done so, but this is just way too familiar. Nevertheless, you're sent in early to set up a beacon for a drop point. It's here that you see some of the sparse scripted elements actually in the game. Unlike its sequels, Call of Duty isn't an entirely scripted playable movie, but a lot of elements are still scripted. Not to make this sound complex or open, you definitely still have those same straight line checkpoint levels where you go in one direction, but there are some missions that exist on a wider map. A small map, but still more open. And you can go just about anywhere you like as long as you accomplish your objectives. The missions of the American campaign are of mixed quality, to say the least. Some of the maps in this campaign feel like they are designed specifically for campaign, but most, like a lot of Call of Duty games, are repurposed multiplayer maps. Regardless of this, it feels like most of the effort was put into this part of the campaign. The night mission is probably one of the best missions in the entire game, as it doesn't feel terribly repetitive. The following defense mission, however, can be frustrating, and it most certainly won't be the last. After some more ripping off of Band of Brothers in Normandy, your unit is selected to go on a secret mission. It was here that I thought a small amount of story might begin to work its way back into the game. But I'd be wrong. You're dropped into the Alps in order to rescue Captain Price and some other British officer. This mission in the Chateau definitely highlights the difficulties of the gameplay. The enemy's ability to kill you rather rapidly, as well as their ability to take an intense amount of damage, combines with the tight corridors of the Chateau to create a very unpleasant level. The final piece of this relatively unpleasant experience is your lack of friendliness. I know Call of Duty is a game series that has become synonymous with a single man murdering some massive army, but some of the better games actually do a pretty good job of making you feel like you're just another soldier on the battlefield. Up until this point, Call of Duty does a decent job, especially considering its predecessor, Medal of Honor, is all about a single person achieving impossible missions. On this mission, however, your team is pretty quickly killed, and you basically have to clear the entire level with one or two guys at your side, if any at all. After finishing a time trial mission, the American campaign ends and the British campaign begins. You'll notice if you go to the menu, the background actually changes based on what campaign you're in. Once again, the campaign begins to make you feel like a soldier in a unit, rather than a single man army, as you're tasked with providing suppressive fire while the AI takes a bunker from behind. 
After securing that bunker, which presumably had some sort of orgy going on inside it, you're then tasked with capturing a bridge and the buildings on the other side of it, and holding them through the next mission. And oh my god, that next mission is absolute hell. You're constantly assaulted by enemy forces from almost every angle, notably the tanks, which never stop spawning. Unfortunately, missions like this would become the theme for the rest of the game. Unlike better games where levels become progressively more difficult, Call of Duty just drops you off a cliff. After completing that mission, just like in the American campaign, you're recognized for your amazing actions and tacked onto some special forces missions. Once again, this feels very much like a Medal of Honor kind of thing. As if the only difference between that game and this one is that they put you into some real world battles first, before they throw you into some fantastical special forces spying nonsense. Anyway, you're sent to Hoover Dam to destroy the NCR's anti-aircraft guns, and well, this mission is absolute hell too. You have to travel all the way from the top of the dam, down through to the bottom, and as if it weren't funny enough, after you complete your objective, you have to do everything you just did in the opposite direction. After your escapades at the dam, you escape in a poorly animated truck chase scene. And suddenly you jump all the way to climbing aboard and sabotaging the German battleship Turpids? By this point, most of the maps in the campaign are just based on multiplayer maps. So is this Turpids mission. Just kinda seems like they wanted to show off the multiplayer map, but didn't really know where to put it in the game, so they just kinda came up with something. Nevertheless, you're out of the British shoes and into the Russians. And in the same way that the American campaign is a very obvious ripoff of Bandit Brother, the Russian campaign is a painfully obvious ripoff of Enemy at the Gates even starting with the same crossing the Volga scene and giving out rifles to every other man thing. After breaking through and completing that mission, you repeat the same charge that happens in Enemy of the Gates. Then what follows is a slew of somewhat repetitive run through the city missions that aren't really worth mentioning. That is until you're tasked with taking this apartment building, which is hell. Every floor is extremely tight, so much so that the corners even clip onto your character, causing them to get stuck in doorways for a few seconds. And of course the enemies are just as ferocious as they have been in the past. So if you get stuck, they shoot you first, and you're dead. However, after finally getting through that, I realized the fun had only just begun, because now you're given the objective to defend the apartment building. Going off what I said earlier, this is a multiplayer map, and I guess they just didn't have more time to add to the level, so they just said, eh, spend more than half a level stuck in the same building. You're given the task of manning two different anti-tank guns, one that's on the second floor and one that's on the third. Then, you must destroy the attacking tanks, which are coming from either side of the building, just like the tanks in the canal mission. The soldiers never stop coming, so rejoice, another timer-based defense mission. And I'm not lying to you when I tell you I have an hour and a half of recorded attempts of me trying to hold this building. At first, I tried to do it the way they wanted me to. Use the anti-tank guns, destroy the tanks, and then use the machine guns, or just good positions of cover, to kill the enemies before they get into the building. But of course, this campaign would never let me get away that easy. You see, the actual timer begins when you destroy the first two tanks, one on either side of the building. I imagine this is to show where the anti-tank guns are positioned. However, whilst you're focused on those tanks, infantry will have already rushed into the first floor of the building and have it cleared. This means almost as soon as you get off the second anti-tank gun, you're into a close quarters firefight, which, if I haven't made this clear already, are absolutely brutal in this game. After attempting and failing to do this for a while, I simply decided to sit on the 4th floor and wait for the timer to run out. However, the game has a contingency for this exact situation. If you sit on the top floor for too long, there will be an artillery strike on the top floor and you will die. Sit on one of the lower floors and the tanks will shoot holes into the side of the building and kill you in a very similar way. It turns out the only real way to beat this mission is to just sit on the top of the stairwell and shoot the enemies as soon as they try to walk up it. Even still with this cheese strategy, it took me way too many attempts to actually beat this level. Like with the rest of the game, if the enemy fires off a shot first, you're as good as dead, regardless of how much health you actually have. It must be said that if you're going to play this game, just play it on normal. It's not worth your time to play it on hardened, and you definitely deserve an award if you could beat it on veteran. The following missions of the Soviet campaign are so utterly repetitive that they're barely worth mentioning, aside from the unexpected but welcome tank segment. And from there, I imagine the game would end. Color me surprised, however, when I found myself on a mission from the perspective of the Americans again. It turns out, for some reason, Call of Duty has conclusion missions. You play one extra mission from the perspective of the Americans, British, and Soviets to tell how their stories supposedly end. Anyway, the Americans have to take out some bunkers during the Bastogne campaign, the British have to take out some V2 rocket launch site, and the Soviets have to storm the Reichstag. I could swear to you that both the American and British levels take place in the exact same map. This massive snow map where the draw distance is atrocious. 
they are pretty standard. Not much to mention, although I was reminded of something that, if I haven't already mentioned it, I figured I ought to bring it up. The checkpoint system in this game is brutally unfair. It takes forever for a new game save to happen, so you may have to go back through a quarter of the level if you die. And with that, just about as soon as it began, the campaign ended. I should honor this game for starting one of my favorite video game franchises, but in the modern lens I can say nothing more than that this has aged poorly. I can't really even imagine enjoying it upon its release, but I'm sure I have a larger repertoire of better games to compare it to. At the time it was probably groundbreaking, but I'm not reviewing the game at the time. 18 years later, what can I say, it's just not that great. If you want to relive the early days of Call of Duty, I really wouldn't return to this one. Or at least, I would play it at a lower difficulty instead. Not that I think it would be all that much more enjoyable even so. 5 out of 10. Not bad enough to justify a negative score, but not good enough to gain a positive one, so it gets the middle of the road average score. I would recommend skipping it, but if you really want to play through the whole franchise, it's not completely appalling.